Please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. I, I, I wanted to find a picture of this, and I was digging through my high school yearbooks, and uh, I couldn't find one, so I'm sorry. But as a kid, trust me, I grew up playing tennis. I played on the high school team. But after high school, I pretty much stopped. Okay, life got busy. But five years ago, I renewed my hobby of playing tennis. And I discovered, hey, the game is the same. I discovered my body was not the same. <laughs> Uh, I remember when I was young, I would hear about older guys, you know, playing sports they played when they're young, and they would injure their Achilles tendon. I remember this. They pushed their bodies too hard. And I thought, what's wrong with those guys? Well, I discovered uh, how it feels. Um, I developed tendonitis in both of my Achilles tendons, and I had to see a physical therapist. Some of you know, tendons are interesting tissue in our body. They have, there's low blood flow. So to promote healing, you have to increase blood flow. And to do that, a physical therapist has to inflict some pain, focused stimulus to get my body to heal. And it took time, and of course it took money. So, to get better, um, I had to ask myself, do I want to get well? Do I want to get well? Because this was going to take time, money, and pain. Yes, I wanted to get better, and thankfully I'm better now, but it wasn't easy. That is true of so many things in life. And it's why our, our modern culture of immediate gratification, uh, getting so many things so easy, has made it hard for us to count the cost, to persevere in difficulty, to be patient and wait for results. The same is true spiritually. We're talking about faith in Hebrews 11. Verse 1 says it. Faith, what is it? It's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And as we saw in verse 6 last week, without faith, it is impossible to do what? To please God. See, faith is what God is looking for in his family. And when he sees it, it brings him pleasure. It doesn't increase his love for you. There's nothing that we can do to cause God to love us more or, frankly, to love us less. His love is unconditional, but his pleasure is conditional. And what is it that brings God pleasure? It is faith. It is faith. He's watching. We saw it last week. Faith is what he's looking for in his family. Um, and when he sees your faith, he remembers you, he recognizes you, and verse 6 tells us he rewards those who seek him. But no one ever said this would be easy. So the point is this, living by faith, increasing our faith, where does that happen best? It happens best in an environment that is actually stimulating our faith. And like so many things in life, it probably is going to involve time and pain and sacrifice. Have you ever heard this phrase? We've talked about it before. Faith is like what? A muscle. I have one in there somewhere. Okay. Faith is like a muscle. And for muscles to thrive, for muscles to grow, you have to use them. If you don't use your muscles, what happens to them? Technical word, what is it? Atrophy, Atrophy that's it. Um, it weakens. 
to the point of degeneration. It actually begins to waste away. So I actually found this on the internet. Okay, I don't, you can find some good things on the internet, but it talks about this. So here's describing this process in our bodies. Muscle size increases when a person continually challenges the muscles to deal with higher levels of resistance or weight. This process is known as muscle hypertrophy. And that's contrast to atrophy. Muscle hypertrophy occurs when the fibers of the muscles actually sustain damage and, or injury. And the body repairs damaged fibers by fusing them, which increases the mass and size of the muscles. So buried in that, injury, damage, that sounds like pain to me. Probably why I don't have big muscles. So pain, some pain is actually good for us. Some pain results in growth and strength. So we have this phrase, you can finish it, no pain, no, no gain. Maybe that's true. If we allow coaches, personal trainers, physical therapists to inflict some pain to help us achieve our physical goals, and we pay them for it, we thank them for it. I mean, can you imagine a team going to the coach and saying, coach, we want to win, but guess what? Take it easy on us. We want this to be easy. We don't want you to work us very hard. How would the coach respond to that? Be like, well, you don't want to win. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to work hard. So if we expect that from coaches, personal trainers, physical therapists, then why would we not expect challenges in our lives to help us grow in our faith? Challenges that God allows, challenges that sometimes God intentionally brings. Why? Because he cares for us and he wants us to grow. I endured the pain my physical therapist was doing to my Achilles tendon because I knew they were trying to help me. They weren't trying to harm me, but to help me, he had to inflict some hurt, some challenges. So here's our big idea today from our text. Faith, like a muscle, grows when it's challenged. That sounds like it might involve some time, some pain, some sacrifice. So let's pray and ask God to soften our hearts to, to hear truth this morning. Lord, thank you that you do love us unconditionally. You do know what we need better than we know what we need. And Lord, as we've talked about in recent weeks, we know that life is not all about us. But we know that You've given us a part to play in your story. And Lord, part of that role that you've given us to play is to help us grow in our faith, to trust you with what you're doing in our lives and in the world. So Lord, help us to see when it is that you are applying some pressure to cause us to grow, that we would not grow weary and give up, that we would trust you. So God, thank you for those who've gone before us as we look at them in this chapter. May we be reminded from their own stories what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So faith, it grows in several challenges we're going to look at in our text. The first is the challenge of not knowing where. So starting in verse 8, this is the first of several challenges that Abraham faced. And um, he gets, Abraham gets more space in this, this hall of faith than anyone else. We actually know a lot about his life, uh, recorded in Genesis 11 to 25. Uh, and he's often referred to throughout the Bible. Abraham was not a perfect man. He made some serious mistakes, lapses of judgment, deceitful behavior. 
So if any of you have failed in those ways, there's hope for here for us. Obedience does matter. Abraham has plenty of that. But as we've said, God is not evaluating us on our performance. He is um, looking for faith. And faith shows up. It grows. It's actually strengthened in times of challenge. I imagine for those of us who've been walking with Jesus for a while, uh, do we grow more in the good times or the hard times? It's the hard times, okay? It's the difficult times when our faith grows. And God saw fit to lead Abraham through some serious challenges. So if you are going through some serious challenges in your life, the question we often ask is why? Why would God allow those things in your life? Now, sometimes difficult things come they're self-inflicted. That's not what we're talking about here. If your challenges are because of your own sin, I recommend you confess, you repent, you ask for forgiveness, you make it right if you can. God will use that in your life to grow your faith also. But when it's not self-inflicted, maybe there's a purpose to it, to help you to grow. So the first challenge here is not knowing where. Not knowing where. So when faced with uncertainty, faith actually does three things here. First is it, it leaves the familiar. Let's look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Most of us know the, the story here. Abraham grew up in modern-day Iraq, not far from Kuwait. Back in the day, it was a nice place, uh, affluent place, kind of like Naples. And he did not grow up in a family that worshipped the true God. We actually learned that in Joshua 24, Verse 2, we learn that Abraham and his family actually worshipped idols just like everyone else. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Okay, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor. And what did they do? They served other gods. So when God called Abraham... He spoke to him. He called him to play his part, to follow him by faith, to leave the familiar and the comfortable, and then to trust him with the details. So do you remember the day or the time or season when God called you to follow him? When God broke through into your life and you knew in that moment he is real. And you knew you had to make a choice. I can keep going my own way or I can obey God. We've said this, obedience matters. What did Abraham do? It says it right in the text. He obeyed when he was called to go to a place he was to receive. So he had to leave the familiar. But here's the amazing part. He went not knowing where he was going. Why would God do that? Big idea. Faith, like a muscle, grows when it's challenged. The destination was not as important as the journey of following and trusting this God who called him. Now, if that was true for Abraham, do you think that's true for us? But here's how we often respond. I'll do whatever you ask, God, as long as you give me all the details. I just want to know what I'm getting into and what to expect. We see that as a right. That would make it easier if God did that. 
But here's what would happen. Our faith would not grow as much. If he gave me all the details, I probably wouldn't go, knowing what's ahead. But choosing to follow God involves not only leaving what we're familiar with, but also faced with this uncertainty, faith embraces the foreign. Look at verse 9. By faith, Abraham went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. So, God leads Abraham and his family eventually to the land of Canaan, uh, Palestine, modern-day Israel. And when he gets there, it's already occupied. Right? Some of you have lived in foreign countries. Perhaps some of you, uh, or, or someone you know, came here, and this is a foreign country to them. Listen, life is more difficult as a foreigner. The language barriers, the culture uh, differences, uh, maybe even our appearance makes us to stand out. And I'm sure when they got there and they realized, wait a minute, this place is already occupied. We're foreigners. I don't even know what these people are saying. I'm sure Sarah asked a few questions. Abraham, is this what we left home for? You see, living by faith em means embracing some challenging environments because that's where God has led us. Why would he lead us there? He's trying to help us grow. Um, we have a part to play in his mission, not ours. So when faced with, with disappointment and discouragement, it's already occupied, we're foreigners here. God, did I, did I not hear you correctly? It would have been easy to turn around, to head back to the familiar. And that is, sadly, what some people do when they embrace faith in Jesus. And then as they get down the road a little further, they realize, hey, this Christianity thing is not what I thought it was going to be. I thought God was going to fix all my problems. I thought God was going to bless me. This is hard. I'm just going back. Now, I can't imagine how many people um, hire personal trainers to help them get into shape, and then they quit partway through because it got too hard. It was taking too long. It was costing too much money. It was just too difficult. I imagine the dropout rate is very high. So what is it that keeps someone from going back to the familiar when the destination is disappointing, maybe, elusive? Um, well, to deal with the uncertainty, here's the third thing faith does. Faith has to anticipate the future. Look at verse 10. So Abraham, it says in verse 9, went to live in this land of promise as a foreign, foreigner. Verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So somehow Abraham knew that the land of Canaan actually wasn't the final destination. It was part of the journey, but Abraham was looking forward to the real promised land, to heaven itself. That is home. So obedience matters. Okay, when God calls, we have to leave the familiar. We have to go. Perseverance matters. Um, even when it gets hard, we embrace living as a foreigner. But what actually gets us through it all is vision. Seeing beyond the here and now, anticipating the future. This is almost the definition of faith from, from uh, verse 1. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
Now, for, for us today, it's easy to lose sight of this, especially living in Naples. I don't know about your neighborhood, but pretty much 100% of my neighbors live in Naples because they chose to live here. They dreamed of living here, and now they're living the dream. They all came from somewhere else, literally from all over the world. And here's why, for us especially, it's easy to lose sight of eternity. Naples is not very disappointing. It's pretty awesome. But even so, this is not home. Not if you've heard the call of God to leave the familiar, to live by faith as a foreigner, to play your part in a bigger plan as we find our way home. But here's what I'm discovering. Once the fun, the novelty of being in Naples wears off, I find a lot of my neighbors are suffering from destination sickness. Okay, you've heard of travel sickness. Destination sickness. They've arrived and now they have no real direction in their lives. They have everything they need, but life has lost its challenge. Now, when muscles are no longer challenged, what did we say? What happens to them? They atrophy. They waste away. So muscles, they need continuous challenge to be healthy. So do people. So do our souls. That's how God designed us. And faith, especially, it's like a muscle. It grows when it's challenged. So not knowing where, when God calls, that's a significant challenge that grows our faith. But so is the second challenge, number two, in not knowing how. All right? So starting in verse 11, this is great news that Sarah is in the hall of faith. Sarah is Abraham's wife. Being married to Abraham was not easy. If you know the story, Abraham was pretty selfish on at least a couple of occasions. It put Sarah in a really tough spot. Now, I'd say for, uh, for most of the men I know, our wives deserve to be in the hall of faith just for putting up with us. But here's the deal. It takes two to tango. If I'm married, God calls me to follow him in faith. We do it as a couple. We help each other, right? Sarah knew the promise that God had made to her husband, that he would be the father of many nations. That required something, having children. So when Abraham got that call, Sarah was already 66 years old. She didn't have that child for another 25 years at age 91. So when God affirmed the promise one more time in Genesis 18, uh, Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 99. So what do you think humanly the chances of that happening were? impossible. So, when faced with the impossible, here's what faith does. Number one, it hopes in miracles. Look at verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age now, do you remember the story in Genesis? What was Sarah's reaction when God said she was 90 years old and said she was going to have this child? Do you remember Sarah's reaction? She laughed. Now, does that mean she was questioning God? Probably. She was going, this is crazy. Yes, she was questioning God. But it doesn't mean she didn't have faith. Okay, so questions. 
Even doubt can be part of a life of faith. How is this going to happen? If you remember, that's what Mary asked the angel. How? How am I going to get pregnant? God can handle your how questions. What he's asking you to do is to trust him. Living by faith, it doesn't mean that I have no doubts, I have no questions. Uh, This is not what living by faith is. Visualizing the results and having positive feelings that what I'm hoping for is going to happen. Maybe you read that in a Norman Vincent Peale book, The Power of Positive Thinking, um, kind of a precursor to the prosperity gospel. That's not what biblical living by faith is. Faith says, I have no idea how this impossible thing is going to happen. I'm hoping for a miracle because that is what it's going to take. But here's the deal. My faith is not in the result. My faith is in the one who can do the impossible. So when I'm faced with the impossible, here's what faith does. Faith trusts in God. Keep reading verse 11 there. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. This is really good news. Okay, Just reading the Genesis account, you would think Sarah didn't have faith. She may have laughed, but it says right here, she considered him faithful. God had made the promise, and as crazy as it sounded, she trusted God with him, with this. Now, the promise was made to Abraham as well, and you know she had to play a part in getting pregnant, right? Okay, Abe, God is faithful, I believe him, but this isn't going to happen unless we do something else first. 90 and 99 years old. When you're faced with the impossible, you still have to do what you have to do. You have to obey. You have to go. You have to persevere. You have to hope. So that faith, even for Sarah and Abraham, still involved them having to act and play their part, do what they could, faith actually expresses itself through obedience. Even when you're facing the impossible, row the boat. Just How are we going to get over there? Just row the boat. Just row the boat. And then faith does this. Third thing, it waits for the promise. Look at verse 12. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. 25 years of obeying God while facing the impossible. You know, some of you maybe have waited a long time for something, not knowing how God was going to do it. You sense that you know he called you. You know he promised. You know he's faithful. So what do you do? You keep waiting. I mean, verse 12 repeats the promise God made to him in Genesis 15. Descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and the grains of sand by the seashore. How many descendants is that? It's uncountable. How many children did Sarah actually have? One. (laughs) Only one. God's ways are not man's ways. God's timing is not man's timing. Immediate gratification is not what builds character. Patience does. Faith, like a muscle, grows when it's challenged. 
So if you are facing an impossible situation, from a human perspective, you're challenged not knowing how is this going to change, step out in faith, obey God. But when you do that, if you find your faith is being stretched, it's being torn, it's actually painful, and you're saying, why would God allow this situation? Why would he actually lead me down this impossible road? Because the results in our hearts, that's more important than the results in our circumstances. The journey actually matters. So hoping, trusting, waiting, it builds our faith. Don't give up. This takes time. I mean, just my... My Achilles tendons took two years for me to recover from. It took lots of work, lots of patience. I can't imagine being a, a doctor, especially, especially a physical therapist, in this culture of immediate gratification. I want it fixed now. It's going to take time. But just like doing what your physical trainer tells you to do. If you will be faithful, follow the plan. If you will be patient over time, if you will not give up, this is what they'll tell you, you will see progress. It will encourage you to keep going. So when Isaac was actually born, that was progress for Abraham and Sarah. But it was not the fulfillment of the entire promise. So there's one more challenge we see in our text today. Faith actually grows in the challenge of not knowing when. Now this one drives us crazy in our culture. Can you imagine ordering something on Amazon and not knowing when it would come? I'm not ordering it. Tell me when it's going to get here. Exactly. Not only do they tell me when, I can choose when. You know, I can choose two-day prime. I can choose one-day delivery. I can track the package and see where the driver is. How in the world did we survive without this? Now, Going back to muscles, you know you can build muscles much faster using steroids. I'm sure you knew that. You can see amazing results, but is it healthy? No. Sometimes I want a spiritual steroid. I'm tired of working hard and struggling and not seeing results. I don't know if you ever feel that way. I can see why athletes are tempted by steroids. I mean, one of the challenges of faith is not knowing when. When, God? When's it going to happen? When am I going to finally see the promise fulfilled? Well, actually, we do know when. It's when we get home to heaven. We're not home yet, but we're homeward bound. So when we're faced with what to us feels like delay, when we're faced with delay, here's what faith does. It looks beyond the present. So continuing, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. So it looks beyond the present. This is what we call having an eternal perspective. Earlier in the book of Hebrews, I, um, do you remember I talked about these stereogram books that we've talked about in the past? 
Okay, here's one of them. It's called Magic Eye, all right? Uh, these are 2D pictures, two-dimensional pictures on a piece of paper that actually become three-dimensional pictures if you look at them just right. Um, not only do they become three-dimensional, actually new things appear that you couldn't see in the, um, when it was two-dimensional. The picture actually changes. But the ink on the paper doesn't change. What is it that changed? How I viewed it changed. So this is, the instructions for this are very instructive for us. You have to look beyond the page to get your eyes to focus beyond the piece of paper. And to do that, you've got to train your eyes to overcome the lifetime habit of how you normally see a page. That's what the book says. If you want to see the stereogram, you have to look beyond. That's exactly what the Bible is saying here. To live by faith, you have to train your soul, you have to train your mind, you have to train your thinking to see beyond this world. And when you do, here's what happens. It enables you to persevere when circumstances are uncertain, when they seem impossible, when it feels like a delay, because you're beginning to see the picture. It's what keeps you from going back to the land you came from, going back to the familiar and the comfortable, because there's something better and you're beginning to see it. So, when faced with delay, second thing faith does, it longs for a better home. Look at verse 16. But as it is, they all died in faith. They didn't get everything that was promised. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. So in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, Jesus was telling his disciples that, that he was going away, that before he was crucified, do you remember, what did he tell them that he was going to go do? He was going to go prepare a place for them. So here it is. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so... Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now, some of us live in pretty nice homes here in Naples. But when you train your eyes to look beyond you realize nothing compares to your heavenly home. Whatever your home is here pales in comparison. So part of perseverance comes when we long for that better home, desiring that better country. Faith looks beyond. It longs for God's better for us. And then finally, it does this. It listens to God's opinion. So let's look at all of verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. He's talking about people who live by faith. God is not ashamed of them. So when a sports team goes out and gives their very best, uh, they leave it all out on the field or on the court, but they still may lose. What does the coach usually, usually say in the post-game interview? How does he view his team? I'm so proud of my team. 
They lost, yeah, but I'm not ashamed of them. It wasn't about the results. It was about their heart. It was about their effort. God is not evaluating the results here. He is looking at your heart. He's looking for faith. He's looking for those who worship him in spirit and truth, who are looking beyond what they can see, people who have a conviction about the future, who trust in his promises, people who are willing to row the boat and be patient, because that grows faith. And people who do that, verse 6, it says it pleases God. It pleases him. Um, I doubt anyone here has heard of a guy named Henry Morrison. He and his wife served as missionaries in Africa for, for over 40 years in the late 1800s. Um, I can't imagine what it was like to live in Africa where missionaries were in the 1800s. The sacrifice, the isolation, um, talk about leaving the familiar and embracing life as foreigners. In the 1800s, there were no airplanes. So they returned after 40 years on the mission field by boat. All right? And the question was, does anyone know we're coming home? Does anyone know that we're coming home? Well, as the boat entered New York Harbor, apparently this is a true story, they could see a crowd. There were balloons. There were banners saying, welcome home. Henry turned to his wife and said, look at the crowd. They haven't forgotten us. But what Henry didn't know is that President Teddy Roosevelt was also on the boat. Uh, he was returning from a hunting trip in Africa so they watched all the fanfare, celebrating the president's return, and then everyone else left the boat, and there was no one there to greet the Morrisons. Henry struggled with this for weeks. He even began to sink into a depression. And he cried out to the Lord, even complaining, Lord, we gladly served you faithfully for years without complaining. But this is so wrong. The president received this tremendous homecoming, but no one even met us as we returned home. But as he finished praying, it was as if the Lord put his arm around Henry and reminded him, Henry, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. New York was not home. Heaven is home. Heaven is when we're home. Now, there's a great old hymn I want us to sing um, as we close. It was written by Eliza Hewitt in 1898, which was about the same time that, that Henry Morrison returned from Africa, and uh, let, let's so let let's stand together, and I'll lead the singing. But you guys, I want you to join, and I want us to think about each one of these verses. Okay, you'll get the hang of it after a verse or two. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. So, okay, that's the vision. You know, when Jesus is preparing a place for us, that that is where home is. But what do we do? 
until we get home. Day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. So again, that vision that's seen beyond the page so that we, we know what's ahead of us. It doesn't cause us to abandon the present. Here's what it motivates us to do. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. So he rewards those who seek him. Verse 6 told us in Hebrews 11, he's seeking worshipers who will trust him believe in him so here's the prize we can look forward to onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will behold soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. We'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's just close in prayer on that. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have, the, the promises that you have made. And like Sarah and like Abraham, like all those who have gone before us, Lord, we know that you are faithful. You can do, you will do all that you have promised. Lord, do it in your way and in your time for your glory. Strengthen us to row the boat of faith Fix our eyes on you, not our circumstances. Lord, would you help us to persevere and be patient? And we thank you for this promise that you reward those who seek you, who have faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have a great day. If you need to hang around here before the rain stops, uh, you know, let's just hang out and enjoy one another as, as we kind of tear things down, but you don't have to be in a rush. But thank you for weathering the storm and worshiping with us, and we'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.